Now, Lord, um, I'm going to then deal with the facts, if I may. Yes, sir. There is a chronology from the appellant at tab three of the core bundle, and I just draw it to your Lordship's attention because it's not, it is the appellant's chronology, not the read chronology. And I'm going to endeavour to fill in some of the gaps. So your Lordship um, has the copy of the skeleton argument um, where I've given quite a few references to the documents, but I'm just going to try and highlight some of them. I may not go to all of them, but you, you have a note there under the factual background. Uh, so you'll see from even the appellant's chronology the identification of the erection of one permanent marquee and one marquee for occasional use in 2006. And if one turns to the supplementary bundle, uh, you will see, uh, my lord, that if I could start at tab one, that there are applications, planning applications that were made for three marquees on the 14th of July 2006. In fact, two of those marquees had already been erected. And the, the point, the relevant point about that, in, when it comes to the question of discretion, <coughs> is that at least two of these marquees were, for a time, what is known as unlawful development. Your Lordship has in my legal section the principles that my Lord, Lord Justice Limbaugh, will be very familiar with, and maybe the rest of the court, but Section 57 of the Act requires planning permission for any development. And if you don't have planning permission, it's unlawful. It doesn't become a criminal offence until such time as enforcement action is taken, but it's unlawful nonetheless. And when it comes to the question of discretion, the fact is the appellant was enjoying the fruits, very profitable fruits, from these marquees, which were unlawful. And, my Lord, um, what's not an issue is that this is an area of green belt, a grade two star listed building curtilage, and a grade two star registered park and garden. And green belt. Green belt. Yeah. Uh, registered, grade uh, sorry, two, grade, grade two, two star listed building yeah. curtilage. And a separately, a grade two star registered park and garden. Your Lordship may be aware you can have both the building listed, but you may also have um, registered parks and gardens, which are sufficient um, uh, heritage interest. If you, which green belt? Which green belt is this? I'll I couldn't find it in the papers. I did look. Uh, well, I'll can, I pa can I pass that along the line to Mr. Evans and part of the local <laughs> planning authority? I'll, 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 um, yeah, well, and I'll pick up those references. In, and the reason I flagged that up, Your Lordship, just to be clear, I'll pick up those references in the committee reports. But my learned friend takes a makes a criticism of the judge to suggest the judge introduce his view of the planning merits of these pieces of development. That is not a fair representation. It's common ground from all the committee reports that the local planning authority regard what this development constitutes as inappropriate development in the green belt for which very special circumstances had to be demonstrated, they were not, save for eventually the use of them for a short period, five years, to pay for the restoration works to the gardens. But no, it's never been in dispute that these marquees should not be where they are. The only thing the planning authority has said is we will allow them for five years so the money that they generate could exceptionally be used to pay for the parks and gardens. It is therefore a totally artificial criticism to suggest the judge was introducing his view of the planning merits. He's reflecting what I will show you to be un indisputable as the view of the planning authority throughout the history and indeed 
perhaps an independent inspector on the enforcement notice. Well, the, um, those planning applications were retrospective for at least two of the marquees, as I explained. And at tab two, you have the committee reports that I referred you to. And uh, I don't want to go through them, but I, you will note that the proposals are subject to strong objections. See at the bottom of the page, because they're recorded. And the director's appraisal of each of the applications appears on the following page. And in that, you will find the very point I've just made the identification in various different shapes and forms of why this development was unacceptable development in this location. My Lord, without complicating it, there are, there are shades and degrees to that because, for example, in the wall garden, there was less visual impact, etc. But in broad principle, each of these reports recommended refusal for at least green belt reasons that they were inappropriate development, absent very special circumstances. And you can see the recommendations for refusal at each bottom of each one of those reports. So that's the planning authority's view. Those, it appears, um, reports didn't actually make their way to a committee because the applications were withdrawn before the meeting on the 8th of March 2007. And the court may well know that developers sometimes choose to withdraw applications where they see the officer's recommended refusal rather than gain a formal refusal. And at tab three, the next stage was issue of enforcement action by the local planning authority. Again, the notion that the judge has introduced some planning view of, of these marquees is, is simply doesn't withstand scrutiny. The council was prepared to take enforcement action against them. That notice is dated the 11th of July, 2007, and it was appealed. And the next document is the inspector's appeal decision. I think it came out on the 24th of November 2008. It's slightly obscured in the top right-hand side of the page. But for my Lord, particularly my Lord Justice Lindblom's um, question about the planning inspector's view, if, you, if one looks at paragraphs 9 to 15 on page 22, you can see what had happened. The withdrawn applications to the marquees had been taken away. In the meantime, some new applications had been submitted. And the question of what was actually on site had obviously fluctuated. But at the time the inspector dealt with her decision, there was only one marquee. The lake marquee was still present. And you can get that from decision letter, paragraph 26 and 27, on page 24. And the inspector dismissed, subject to variation of the notice, the appeal against the enforcement notice. And you can see she did so on planning grounds, page 26, 27, 28 all reject the case being made, including a case that it was enabling development, namely development that would assist in the uh, restoration of the heritage assets. And I'm taking that at speed, but you, I'm just giving you the outline. So you not only have a planning authority that's considered the at least the marquees, all of them should be dismissed, but here is an inspector endorsing the lakeside marquee properly being the subject of enforcement action. And then, following that, um, in the next tab, you'll see the notices of refusal of planning permission on the 6th of July 2009 for those applications that the inspector had identified were outstanding. The planning authority issued three notices of refusal, again, for the three marquees. And again, without wearing your lordships too much, the clear planning reasons as to why the developments are unacceptable are set out in each of the notices. Common to all of them is its inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. A further enforcement notice followed, page 34, 
in relation to what presumably was the only marquee up, up at that time, the 14th of April 2010, enforcement notice against the lakeside marquee. So my, that's the background to this development. Can I immediately contrast it, if you permit me, with the sorts of cases my learned friend's taking me to, where a developer applies for planning permission for development which hasn't taken place and is seeking consent in order to proceed and notification procedures occur. And the reason one of the underlying principles of certainty is that the developer, once they receive the planning permission, is likely to commence the development by constructing whatever it may be, large houses or uh, and expending considerable sums of money in proceeding with the development. That's the basic principle that underlines the need for celerity or at every possible celerity in, in a challenge and a notice period. But it has less force in circumstances where one has already commenced unlawful development and is seeking retrospectively to obtain consent for it. I say less false, I'm not suggesting the same principle is inapplicable, but it's a relevant fact. What then happens, uh, of course, where my learned friend picked up the story, was the submission of an application, yet a further application, for the three marquees, and you find that at page 37. That was the application made on the 9th of April 2010. The court doesn't have... The, all the accompanying documents, but it was again submitted with a case for enabling development. Namely, we will use the money to, to uh, pay for restoration of the um, historic parts of the gardens, amongst other things. Uh, at least, um, my learned friend accepts at least one of the marquees was already there, the, the lakeside still hadn't been removed. Uh, of course, it, it again, it, it prompted objections, not least from my clients, and there's an objection letter on page 43. Uh, I don't need to take your, your lordship through it, but we, there was objection, detailed objection to the case for enabling development, querying the profits that were going to be made, which seemed to be far greater than the plan for putting the money back into the site. And the point, although the principle here, is where a planning application is made, it's notified to the public. It's the development management procedure order explains how that's to be done. It may be by site notice. It may be by letter. It will be by advertisement in the local press. The principle in Gerber is that persons in the area are expected to respond to that notification and it's misfortunate if they don't notice those procedures being followed. But there's a fair expectation or it's a print matter of principle that it's fair to assume you would get notice <coughs> from that procedure and to then if you mind about the development, you take part by making your representations. No criticism can be made of the claimant to the interest of the party in this case, because that's precisely, um, sorry, first respondent, I should say, in this case, because that's precisely what they did. They took part in the process, made their representations. That led to a planning committee report, of the 21st of July 2010, on page 51. The officers recommended in that report refusal of the application because the case for enabling development was not made out, not sufficient detail. But could I just ask your Lordship to note about that? Page 53, halfway through the, in the introduction, after the proposal constitutes inappropriate development of female, it's a major application, you see introduction heading, and then halfway through, Permission for the marquees is being sought by the applicant for a period of 25 years. My, my learned friend made a submission, it was a permanent permission. Well, that's certainly not what's recorded in the documents before the court. 
and certainly not what's in the committee report, and it's never been corrected. The applicants never, sorry, the appellants never written a letter saying we were seeking a permanent commission. They were permanent structures, which is why they attracted the need for planning permission, because they're very large marquees. But it was a, for a 25-year period. And my Lord, that's when I point out that when you got an unconditional permission, you were getting something that not even you had asked for. And you will also see in that reference the, the identification that the lakeside marquee had already been erected. There apparently had been an appeal against the enforcement notice, which another hearing had been scheduled. And my Lord, at the page 55, you can see the conclusion of the officer in July identifi identified visual um, impact. The proposal results in three large structures in Greenbelt for a period of up to 25 years. It's a considered view of the local planning authority that proposals are not accompanied by sufficient very special circumstances which would justify approval and outweigh the harm to the Greenbelt. And that's supported by the Director of Finance assessment of their um, financial argument. Not lack of sufficient detail, recommendation for refusal. Uh, in the event, your lordships will see that it went back, it wasn't determined at that meeting, it went back on the 7th of September, page 56. And um, page 58, you'll see director's comments, the application was deferred for a committee site visit and to consider further information. It's page 58, about halfway down, <coughs> relating to the financial case put forward. So further, what say page here? 58, my Lord, directors. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. So what we were looking at before was a recommendation for refusal. My Lord, yes. officer for a planning committee meeting on the 21st of July. Exactly. They had their so what, meeting. Uh, so what, why, why, what, what, what is this next one? If, if, if they had their meeting, yeah. and it, you can see that what actually happened is that the application was what's known as deferred and it was deferred to allow site visit by the committee and to receive further information about the financial case and you can see that from what is reported back to the committee on the 7th of September 2010. The director uh, explains that on page 58. Well that's about halfway, well about a third of the way down by the first hole punch. Director's comments, the application was deferred. And um, again, it's still identified as a permission for up to 25 years. But in the course of the analysis, there's consideration of the financial information. I don't read it all out, but the upshot of it is the, the um, officers recommend a temporary permission for five years only for money to be spent on the gardens. They did not accept that it would necessarily take 25 years for those where works. Where is that? Uh, my Lord, you can see it's, it's sort of a lengthy analysis, but it occurs through um, 59 uh, to 60, and sort of last big paragraph on page 60 above appearance and immunity issues. The applicant submitted a restoration cost report. Costs approximately 1.9 million for the restoration works. Income generated from one um, in the Hillbark Hotel was a comparator. They said you could generate that from one marquee for a period of five years. And so based on that, they didn't consider it was necessary to grant permission for 25 years. They said five years to um, see what would happen. Does your Lordship have that paragraph? Uh, and that's... And what is this reference here in that same paragraph to the likelihood of a hotel consent being fully implemented, being reassessed? My Lord, in the background, there was a, an existing permission for a spa and hotel in the main building, which Historic England, or English Heritage that then was, had said should be relinquished 
because it was potentially a profitable consent for the use of the main listed building, but the appellant was refusing to relinquish it, um, but instead saying we need the marquees to generate money, because the possibility was money could have actually come from the use of the hotel building, and there was concern that you might get money being generated from both if the hotel consent were implemented. That's the so, so there was there was hotel consent already for the use of the main building. Yes, in, dis, in contradistinction to the. Consent it's quite a complicated. <laughs> consent the use of the main building as a hotel and but spa. The, the, but it was as a hotel, Money. but they didn't want to implement that. Correct. I don't know if I speak for others, but what I would find really helpful, and we lack it, I think, is the the, the map. drawing that um, form part of the relevant planning application. That's to say, drawing in the bottom right hand corner, 1699 100. Um, my, my recollection is from looking at the website is that all the uh, annotations in the body of the plan are on the original document. The Someone in my team has put notes on the left-hand side, which are additional to the submitted document, um, simply give, giving either the same or, or further information. So, with the, the blue land is lake and canal cut. What is the boundary? On this map. No. <laughs> and but at uh, what distance is it from this? Mile and a half. In which direction? North, south, east, south. South, east, south. Well, this map might be the wrong way around, so because if you look at the bottom left hand corner, you see East Lodge. So if the map had north at the top, that would be the other side of the image. I don't know about that matters at all, but anyway. I will find out that it's facing yeah. north. It doesn't have a north no. uh, point on it. I I would um, there is there was a very poor copy of the con site context at the beginning of the committee report, and you can't really make out um, much from that. That does appear um, to if. If your lordship were to turn this plan 90 degrees, 
uh, would record with the uh, plan at the front of the committee report on page 56. That would indeed put East Lodge to the east. Mm -hmm. It's actually off that plan, I'm afraid, my lord. It's, it's I'm told it's about here. Yeah. My lord, then, um, your lordship asked me about the hotel consent. There's a yes. more detailed explanation of it, which I won't read out, but it's 50, page 59 yes. of the committee report. The position of historic English heritage concern about that is explained in the paragraphs um, from halfway down onwards. And the thing that shifted was a, a, a belief that the that consent wasn't necessarily viable to implement. So the, the, the position was the English heritage generally supported the provision of the marquee as a device for funding the restoration of gardens. They no longer take to be constructed and be treated. Correct. Then the support is additional and revocation of the extent of it. I think the legal being where the English Heritage now advises to the You'll see in the last paragraph, the applicants now submitted additional confidential information which indicates the manor is not operating at sufficient profit. One of the problems faced by the claimant stroke um, first respondent is that it is not given the information that is said to support the case. over the page there's a discussion of why 25 years is considered by too long the potential for a greater number of events greater level of income and then the comparator that I took your lordships to of another hotel marquee and the impression correct me if I'm wrong because I don't think it's a little put in the case but just looking at this what's said about English heritage. And the terms of the proposed planning commission in due course, which talks about a review, um, and the review is tied to whether or not the financial returns are really sufficient to justify this. And so the impression that I've got at the moment, please do correct me if I'm wrong, is that English heritage have generally changed their position. They're so concerned about the state of these gardens that... Um, They've, 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 they've changed their view about the structure as being overly intrusive. And basically what they want is they're happy for, they are they content for these structures to remain if and so long as the income from them is tied and sufficient to restore the gardens. My Lord, that's, that's, that's correct. That is a, that's what's known as enabling development, yes. otherwise unacceptable development, yes. which wouldn't get planning permission, is allowed yes. either permanently or for a short period, depending on what it is, yes. in order to finance what's known as the conservation deficit in, in the parliament. But, 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 but that extent I may just carry on for a moment. But, but that indicates, and I think it supports, the position that, that, that if there was a sufficient case made out at the end of the five years for continued financial support for restoration and maintenance of the gardens, then it wouldn't be, um, at least at this stage, counted out of the range of possibilities uh, that uh, the uh, um, planning commission could be extended. 
Oh, well, that's I, I, that's correct. We haven't suggested the contrary. And, I, and the judge, in, in, in fairness, as I'll show you, wasn't suggesting to the contrary. No, but there is what, certain language what, of the judge about the nature, quite emphatic language, about the nature of the intrusion and the green that belt and uh, you know, that these shouldn't be there at all. You know, and so well, on. that's that's correct. They shouldn't be there. But they, they would or were being tolerated, provided that the income yes. was generated and a demonstrated schedule of program of works to repair the gardens was entered into, hence the Section 106, the importance yes. of the Section 106 mechanism. But that doesn't detract from the principle that the marquees, in, in planning terms, shouldn't be there. They're an exception to generate sufficient income. The five-year permission yes. had a condition, or should have had a condition, which meant that absent a further extension, <coughs> which would have to be sought and justified by reference to financial information as to what had occurred, that development became unlawful the day that that permission expired. You say should have had. Are you saying that was what or would have been the effect of Condition 1? Indeed. Yeah. So the effect is... Condition 1... That's where we're getting eventually and coming to it. But Condition 1, contrary to the submission made by the other side, Condition 1 doesn't positively require you to remove the marquees. No. But its effect is that after the five years have gone by, the marquees are not lawfully on the site. And are uh, on vulnerable. Absolutely, my lord. And and to put, can I, I, might, I might as well skip ahead to put that in context. Because, because, so, so, my lord, this, none of this was um, controversial. This this point about condition one and misinterpretation wasn't run below. There's no evidence that you'll see. You've got the skeleton arguments, and it's not recorded in the judgment. And the reason one can see is that it, it's un, certainly, so far as the local planning authority was concerned. If you turn, if you just skip forward to the chronology to page 110. This was a letter from the local planning authority sent. 110, my lord. It's a letter dated the 15th of March 2017. Yes. Unauthorized marquees. I refer to the marquees cited within the grounds of Thornton Manor. Planning permission was granted under 11th of November, so that was the belief at the time. I'll come back to that. Immediately, I just want to understand this. It's the presence of the... It's not the presence of the marquees that was then unauthorised. No, it was their use. No, both, my lord. It's the presence. They, they, they are allowed to be there for five years only. If they are there after the five years has elapsed, they are unlawful development. There is no longer any planning permission for them to be there, and they constitute... Yeah. They constitute what we call operational development. P precisely. Uh, and as operational development, they did not have the benefit of the planning permission, assuming that the condition had been invoked um, after five years. They were there, therefore, un they were operational development without planning permission, and thus unlawful at that point. My Lord, that... You won't be surprised me to, me to agree with that. that, but that's clearly right as a matter of law. And, and therefore, why what... Are they, why are they operational rather than structures? They, were stru they are structures, but because of their nature, and, and this is actually covered in the inspector's appeal decision, because they're of a certain size and affixed to the ground in a certain way, they are deemed to constitute operational development more akin to a building because they are, have the attributes of permanence which, for example, a temporary marquee that you might put up in your own garden wouldn't. There's a, there's a planning judgment to be made about when you move into one to the other, like polytunnels, for example. But in this case, the inspector on the enforcement notice had dealt with that point. It, everyone was agreed these marquees were in the permanent structure um, type category, not the temporary type development, which wouldn't require planning permission. They were sufficient size. I just want to see what would have, I just want to my, my what would have happened if the um, appropriate planning commission should have been granted, was granted, 
then presumably at some stage before it expired, uh, if they wanted to do so to continue using the marquees, uh, before it expired, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the interest of party appellant would have applied uh, for a new planning permission or an extension of this one. They could, do, they could do either make a new application they big, or they could make an application under Section 73 of the 1990 Act, which allows you to get a new permission with bearing a condition. And as Condition 1 should have been paid, one could have asked for a new condition, say for another year or two years or, or longer, and you'd have to justify that application on its own merits. Or you could make a new planning application. There are two different ways of doing the same thing. But, my Lord, I was just showing you what actually happened on the assumption that a condition had been imposed, because that was the council's understanding at the time, and I'll show you why they had that understanding. But page 110, on the 15th of March, at the end of the five-year period, a planning officer went to look at the position, found the marquees were still on site. There hadn't been any application to extend them. They were unauthorised, and he required uh, them to be removed, yes. um, failing which enforcement action would be taken. So, my Lord, I accept that you can have conditions requiring removal, but you, there's no requirement to have such a condition. And indeed, I certainly don't accept it's commonplace to have But them. the logic of what was proposed was, let's see what happens over the next five years. Clearly, if you require them to be removed, then presumably the, the manor would have said that's nonsensical because we may need to go on for another five years. We may need, so we mustn't prejudge that. So the sensible thing was to build in the time condition, see whether so much money was generated they didn't need more time, not enough money was generated so it wasn't worthwhile. Look at it again. My Lord, exactly. So there's perfect sense in having a condition which didn't require removal because it was anticipating the potential for a change in application. Nothing unusual about that. As it happens, no monies were paid um, under the Section 106 arrangements that they had entered into. I'll show you that in the July 2017 report, or at least none of the obligations that they had entered into were complied with. And that comes to the point about clean hands if you're seeking the exercise of discretion. But I'm jumping forward. Can I take your Lordships back to the committee report? The, the terms of the committee report on page 61 are clear. It was a, intended to be a five-year permission only. And the reasons are very clear. Page 61. But one should not ignore the fact, my lord, that condition one was dealing with the five-year consent. Conditions two to ten were dealing with important other planning controls. The Dell needed a noise barrier because of the impact on residents. The lake marquee needed a noise barrier. The dell needed a noise limiter. The lake needed a noise limiter. There needed to be signage to the marquees because you have lots of people traveling in the area. You needed internal road widening, condition seven. You need parking areas laid out properly. You needed no external lighting because you were protecting the wildlife bats, etc., those things which are adversely affected, and no fireworks in nesting seasons because of the adverse effects. All of these conditions were part of the only authority that was given to the officers to issue permission. All of them have been omitted in the document. <coughs> when you come to the minutes of the meeting, page 63, and these aren't the full version, there's a full version in the original claim bundle, but you can see on page 64 that the petitioner addressed the meeting. I think, I'm not sure if that was us or someone else, but the, we were certainly present. And a representative of the applicant addressed the meeting. It's halfway down the page on page 64. 
and there was a resolution seven to five, so it was a close thing, but to resolve it subject to the conditions, all of those conditions. This isn't actually, it goes dot, dot, dot at the very bottom, but it's not controversial that it was all the conditions mentioned. So, my lords, there can be no doubt that the appellant knew that the only authority being granted <coughs> by the planning committee to the officers under their scheme of delegation was to issue a permission with those conditions on it, subject to the negotiation of the Section 106 agreement. So the officers had the power to negotiate the Section 106. They did not have any power or authority to issue a permission which excluded any of these conditions. Just pausing there for a moment, the first respondent who attended that meeting would also have been aware that that was the terms under which consent was being granted. It knew that there was going to be some indefinite period of Section 106 negotiations. There's no way of knowing how long that would be. But the only authority was to issue a condition with all those terms. It was not, and never has been, the intention to challenge the grant of that planning permission. But you know, who actually attended for um, the first responder? It was a representative of the company. I can give you a name. Is that, is that in evidence? Uh, my Lord, it's in the... Yes, I think it... Probably is, but it's certainly in the minutes that I've just shown your lordship to of the meeting. Uh, oh, well, no, sorry, it's not. That's the representative of the applicant. Yeah. I think it is in evidence. I'll see if I can trace I mean, track I it trace there somewhere. I couldn't immediately see it when I flicked through. But the minutes record that a petitioner addressed the meeting. Was that? That was Christine Mason. I think that wasn't, that wasn't us. That was somebody else. That was in uh, Well, I'll see if we can find the reference in the, in the, if there is a reference in the evidence. I, I, if I, look for it, I, I know it's stated in your, in your written submissions. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's, if it's common ground or not. I just couldn't find it in the evidence myself. Um, we know well, that I, um, he remained instructed throughout this period or not? Well, my Lord, it, uh, that's the point my learned friend makes is what remained instructed. He, he certainly wasn't instructed, as I, as I think he says in one of his statements, to review or keep this under constant review. Right. He was instructed to make objections. Um, he wasn't instructed on a sort of roving basis. That, that is, I believe, in evidence in the second witness statement. Mm. And it, it, subject to the point about who attended, my Lord, but it, just standing back for a moment, the objector knows that what has been the only resolution that's been made by the authority is to grant a planning commission with a condition, amongst other things, for five years only. Well, I, I, you know, I don't think it's difficult. I mean, can you actually show me the evidence? I think this is quite important. I'm sure you're right. Well, I think we just will be shown the evidence. Let me see. Mr. Just picking up on, if I did turn, the point my Lordship raised. The second witness statement to Mr. Gilbert, page 185, deals with the instruction that he had. Paragraphs 4 and 5. He had an instruction to make an initial objection. Paragraph 5, he um, had an instruction to make a representation to the government office in the Northwest to have the application called in. So 
it's a partial answer to my Lord's question, or the Master Royal, because um, <coughs> the, in order to make the representation about calling, one has to know the resolution that was made at the committee meeting. So Mr Gilbert was instructed following that committee meeting and the resolution that was made to make a, a request for call-in of the application. The thought that if you're going to make a, an application for it to be called in, you'd actually see what the actual planning commission was. Well, my lord, well, can I just, let me just deal, deal with that. What, what you know, what you know is that the, the, the only authority is that which has been set out in the planning resolution by the council. Uh, have you, you haven't shown me who attended this meeting. Oh, Lord, I haven't, because I, I'm not sure it identifies who attended. Well, where does it say but, somebody actually did it? Uh, well, I... assist on that manual. We, we don't have any notes of the personnel who attended. No, no, I just mentioned the evidence here. Yeah, well, I, well, I, I don't know the answer, but I don't know. Think it's so? We don't think it's in the evidence. It's not in so. So, so basically what you're relying on, we had it on the evidence, so what you're relying upon, I think at the end of the day, is paragraph five of, and it may be sufficient, of Mr Gilbert's witness statement. That's what you're really relying on. My Lord, I would understood that it was in evidence and certainly the controversy was what someone was actually there. But if, if, that's not, if that's not in evidence, what is in evidence is that the interested party knew the terms of the resolution made the on that. The interested sorry, party. The, I'm so sorry, the first respondent. Yes. Knew Your the client. My client. Yes. Knew the terms of the yes. resolution that was made uh, at that meeting. Maybe Mr. Mockham Mummy's got instructions. He can agree something is there. I have no idea. Have you, have you well, Lord, I just said instructions. Mr. Landor was was at the um, so that is in evidence meeting, and that is in evidence. Um, and he, it is not in evidence, as I understand it, as to who on behalf of my friend's clients was there. Uh, and Mr. Landor doesn't know. Right. Well, that's what uh, I'm it's, it's, it's the relevant bit of Mr. Gilbert's evidence. I think is paragraph 15 on page 159, and he certainly doesn't say that he attended, and he doesn't actually identify that anyone attended. He was aware of the officer's report. At the top of page 160, he suggests that interested parties have no opportunity to comment on the officer's report. I think that's the thrust of it. He's aware of the outcome of the meeting. Did the judge say that? He, did the judge say he thought somebody had attended? Did the judge deal with this? Claimant was among the objectors, um, is what it yeah, says. 11. It doesn't say. An agent of the claimant attended, paragraph 11. Where did he get that? I, I don't, my lord, I, I presume it was a submission or might have been taken on as a submission at the hearing itself from from uh, the parties. Anyway, there's no evidence of that. There may not make any difference at all. Well, my lord, it's but not, if I put it in this way, it's in the judgment. It's not a factual conclusion which is challenged in, in front of this court. Um, it, it's not a, as I understand it, and the, um, if, if it were said to be not correct um, or, and it mattered, I would expect it to be, to be challenged. I conjecture that at that stage the claim is being represented by other legal counsel. That's correct. And it's possible, we don't know, It is possible. I, I obviously can't 
take it any further than that. Um, but if, if my Lord is, um, it's in the judgment. It, it's not controversial so far as the appellant's concerned. Otherwise, no doubt they would have added it to the uh, grounds of appeal. Um, and then, no doubt, we could have produced a, a, a witness statement as to precisely what happened at the hearing or whatever. Um, but for my part, I don't, unless your Lordship wants to pursue it further, the, the, the central point for my purposes is that the claimant knew of the minutes or the resolution. And uh, as Mr. Gilbert makes plain in his witness statement, and those obviously contain the assurance or how long, the authority, the limited authority to grant permission on the terms identified. So, um, Lord, where I was in the chronology, uh, if, if anything else turns up, I can assist with what happened at the I'll, I'll no doubt be told. But, um, the planning committee makes its decision. The officers then go away and give effect to it. And, my Lord, that is part of the statutory code. My learned friend talks about pioneer and the importance of statutory code. But Section 70 of the 1990 Act is a power to grant planning commission on the local planning authority. That's the council. The council can delegate power to an officer, but subject to that delegated, the terms of the authority that given by the council. The planning committee has already been delegated the functions to determine planning applications by the council through a scheme of delegation. It then, in this case, because it was a matter that had to go to committee as a major application, I've shown you the passage in the committee report, it then decides the application and gives whatever powers, be it a refusal or grant or grant on conditions, to the officer. The officer has no power to step outside that authority. And to do so is just as much a breach of the statutory code as um, was being identified in the pioneer case. My learned friend submitted, well, what, how the council regulates itself is something outside the planning code. Well, it's not. The planning code identifies the decision has to be taken by the council. And it's therefore highly relevant um, whether or not an officer issues um, something without authority. So if it's they... Entirely parallel with Norfolk and Entirely. There is no distinction of principle between issuing a permission when you were told to issue a refusal as compared with issuing a permission which is unlimited in duration when you were told to issue one for five years. Both are unlawful. Both are without authority. And both are classic examples where the court will step in to intervene and quash the unlawful act, subject, of course, to the extension of time. And my learned friend's criticisms of the judge in that respect in my submission, are baseless. Indeed, they don't even make a lot of sense because much of his case is focused upon the principle that a judicial review claim should have been brought earlier. But at the same time, he's saying, had a judicial review been brought at all, he would have argued there was no power to rectify the mistake. Well, that, my lord, cannot be right. Uh, it is not right on the face of the authorities. Well, then what happened, of course, is that the, following the resolution, there was a period of over a year, 14 months, during which negotiations took place between the council and the um, appellant, negotiating the terms of a section 106, to which no party was uh, privy. Indeed, when we asked for the Section 106 on this issue arising, and you'll see Mr. Um, Gordon's witness statement, we were refused access initially to the Section 106 on the basis it was confidential. And so, my Lord, all that the uh, 
claimant knew, of course, there was that there was authority to issue a five-year permission. As to when that would happen, no one knew. And as it turns out, it took more than 15 months for the Section 106 to be negotiated. My learned friend is putting forward a proposition that a party who is content with the terms of a resolution, because it says what it says, is under a duty to instruct someone to monitor, presumably <coughs> on a daily basis, the council's website for an indefinite period until such time as a planning permission eventually emerges following negotiations of a Section 106 agreement. Your Lordships may or may not be aware that Section 106 negotiations can take years. My Lord, that is, if that's right, a startling proposition that a party who has only the legitimate expectation that a planning permission would be issued in the terms authorised is under a duty to check that everything goes according to that which the council has ordered. There was no notice to interested parties. I'm 106 is finished. Here's the planning permission come. No, Lord, absolutely not. There's no notice of what's going on behind the scenes. And when a planning permission is eventually issued, no notice that that's been issued. That presumably is, 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 is true in virtually every planning permission application. My Lord, that, that is right. If one turns up to a, or takes part in a planning process, and you object to the planning application, and you are planning to challenge the resolution and the subsequent issue of the decision, you can do one of two things. You can challenge the resolution to start with. You don't have to wait until the grant of permission. And this has been up to uh, the House of Lords, as it then was um, in the case of Burkett. But you are entitled to await the decision notice itself before bringing the challenge. But if you do so, you have to be aware that the decision notice may come at some unknown point in the future, and you have to be alert to monitor the situation um, because you're expecting a decision notice which you are aggrieved by and you're intending to challenge. Well, for example, they may, not be, they may or may not agree on a Section 108 agreement. Sorry, my, my well, you can't be certain whether there will be planning for me. If, if, if their condition is an agreement on a pretty good terms for a Section 106 agreement. Well, it may never result. I, it may I or may not result. I mean, uh, that's but right. The, but the, uh, in this area, the policy of the law, as I understand it, is to approach a very harsh approach. It's, on one thing, it's a very, very harsh approach, what? which is, if you don't know within, within a few months, too bad. Well, my Lord, that, that's, that's not the approach, with respect. The approach is you need to challenge within three months. If you don't know what's happened, generally speaking, save in exceptional circumstances, it will be too bad. And the reason for that, in the Gerber-type case, and the, as well, I'll show your Lordship, the person who takes part in the planning process is deemed to know what the decision made by the council is. What is the terms of the resolution? The terms of the resolution, if they are to grant planning permission on terms that you find unacceptable, allow you to bring a challenge to that or to await the decision notice itself. If the terms of the resolution, as in this case, are on terms that you are not aggrieved by or intending to challenge, you have no expectation, let alone requirement, in my submission, to check that the council is actually, the officers are actually going to issue a planning permission in the terms they said they would. Uh, so, my lord, things get a little bit worse, as I've explained on the facts here. But um, certainly, it's a surprising proposition that uh, an applicant is under some duty to monitor the situation 
where it can assume that the resolution is going to be acted on faithfully according to its terms. That's precisely the, if you flip it on its head, if, the, if you objected in principle to the permission being granted at all on any terms, and you see a resolution saying, subject to 106, issue a permission in due course, then yes, you're under a duty to monitor, or indeed you can challenge the resolution then and there. You're under a duty to monitor when that permission might come in to play. You're not going to get any notice of it. But that's a very different situation to that which my clients found themselves in here. This, this is a very unusual case, you say. Um, <coughs> it may actually be very unusual, in which um, the local planning authority failed to issue a planning commission in accordance with its own resolution. Precisely. Well, that's, that's really the, the, the nub of this, might get your response to Well, I, I, I do submit that, and it's, it's in direct contrast to Finn, Kelsey, Gerber, Connors, where in each and every one of those cases, take Gerber, for example, someone didn't, says they didn't know about the planning application and only found out about it once development was started. But they're deemed to have had the opportunity to participate in the process and know the outcome because of the notification procedures. But by contrast here, we did participate. The result that was authorised is the one that we are prepared to live with. There's no reason to challenge it. I get permission. We expect in due course that uh, uh, we're entitled to expect under the presumption of regularity or legitimate expectation, however one might put, put it, that the officers will act in accordance with their authority. And certainly it is exceptional to find that they don't. And I don't accept that this is a common Occurrence. My learned friend makes that assertion. Uh, there's no evidence that this is a common occurrence. <coughs> Mistakes do happen. We've seen an example in the Norfolk case that they're very unusual to happen in such dark terms. And where they do happen, the court has the power to step in, in an exceptional case, to allow for an extension of time, bearing in mind questions of prejudice that may arise, which is what I want to turn to. Is this appellant truly prejudiced by the late challenge that occurred at the end of the five-year period? In my submission, no, for the following reasons. What uh, you have been shown is the, what my learned friend calls the bogus document on uh, page 90 of the bundle, 20th... Uh, so sorry, it's page... 87 of the bundle, the November 2011 permission that appeared in, on the website in May 2012. But pausing for a moment and describing it as a bogus document, it's actually... Um, the planning permission in, uh, in its form which the appellant had understood would be granted and uh, was included in the signed section 106 agreement because it contains the relevant conditions. Well, where's the point in this? My Lord, is the appellant prejudiced by what actually occurred? The, the, the so-called bogus document contains all of the conditions that, that would be expected. What actually was issued on the 20th of December was the document without the conditions. And you've got that at page 90. But the appellant, as they've made clear, knew that that was a mistake. They knew it was outside the terms of the officer's authority. Had they looked at the case law with, with advice, they would know that it was an unlawful permission outside the terms of the authority. And they knew, would know, 
that, of course, um, absent other people knowing this, the, it was a document at risk. It was at risk of challenge within the three-month period and would have been quashed, undoubtedly, if it, time wasn't an issue. No one disputes that. And it's at risk after the three-month period if the court decides to extend time for exceptional circumstances. They, know, they must or they should be deemed to know that. What do they do other than check the website to see whether the document's on the website? Mr. Landor does nothing. At least there's no evidence of him doing anything. They don't raise it with the planning authority. They sit silent, or at least he does. What the gap um, in the evidence, however, or the silence, relates to what Mr. Landor did with the notice vis-à-vis -vis his client, the appellant. One assumes, I think, that, that it's, we're told that it was sent to the appellant, but there's no details of what Mr. Landor advised um, his appellant was the consequence of this document. At no, one, at no point is there any evidence he said, you can rely upon this document as a, a permanent permission. You've had a windfall. You've got a document that we all know is a mistake. Don't say anything, and we'll see what happens. There's no evidence of that kind, of what the appellant was told. What we do know is that the council, obviously, in May, um, took that document down. But my learned friend hasn't told you, but it's in the evidence, that whilst that document was on the website, there were two other versions of the decision notice on the website at the same time. And those were the versions with the conditions on. All that Mr. Landor says, when he checked the website, he saw those other versions. One, page 172. You have to piece it together. The July 2017 council report tells us that they were versions with the conditions on. Paragraph 6. I therefore checked the council public access website to see if the decision notice was on the public record. It was. There are also two other decision notices, which, as far as I can recollect, appeared to be drafts. That's, that's as much as he says. And where are those documents? Uh, well, they're referred to in the July 2017 report, and I'm not sure the council kept them. They took down the uh, one of them, and then they put the what my loan friend calls the bogus document well, they up. Took down, as I understood it, they took all down of them, all uh, three. I'm uh, just um, finding the including, including the planning permission they issued. What did they do with the other two? Um, my lord, uh, it's paragraph two point eight. Okay. of the July 2017 report, um, page 135. <coughs> 135. In fact, we're not even told what the other versions were. Paragraph 13, sorry, page 135, yeah. paragraph 2.8. This is the council's, what, what's referred to as the Mayor Cooper report. Yes, but we're looking at we're looking to see exactly what the corpora was. Well, my Lord, from our perspective, we don't know. But what all we know is what we've been told. We didn't look at the website, and I've already explained why my clients wouldn't have done or needed to. If you had looked at the website as Mr. Landor did, you would have seen that decision notice, and you would have seen two other decision notices, two other versions of the decision. Well, the best, the best we get is to two eight, but at this point it appears that the three notices have taken down. Yes, that's the best we know. And the reason why it has to be written that way, as Mike has said, is because so much time has now gone by. The person
personnel of the church, which can move these quite sure. What, what my Lord, that, that may be the case. I think but we may need a bit more. 2.5. 27th May 2011, draft decision notice was uploaded to the website. Uh, and then 22.6. Uh, notice published to the website, further draft, but it did list all the relevant conditions. So it looks as if at least one of the draft versions had all the relevant conditions in it. My Lord, I, I think um, is that, is that both, both drafts would have done because the draft decision notice attached to the 106 had all the conditions. Um, I, all right. And well, actually, yes, you're right. 2.6, I don't know what it would have had. But at least one of the versions would have had all the conditions yeah. on it. Piecing, piecing the jigsaw together, we probably have the picture that the May and, November and September drafts were, were uploaded and left there. They, of course, weren't signed. Well, they were signed, well, they strangely, were. yes. Because well, you can see the draft. You can see in the section 106, it actually is... Your Lordship looks at it... Um, Schedule yeah, 2. Well, it's a signed document. We, noted that we, we do know that they were signed. Yeah. Well, Lord, yes, because the one the version attached to the 106 um, yeah, but signed, I think it's got the... But it does have the watermark draft, I think, on it. So how do we know that the May and September draft were signed? Um, well, just taken from 2.5... On 27th of May, a draft decision notice was prepared to be appended to the Section 106 agreement that was sent to the applicant's agents for signing. So, I'm, if I'm inferring that that's the, the 106 didn't alter, but certainly Schedule 2 of the 106 contains the signed version. Yeah. That's, that's my inference. Well, we know that, but I'm not asking about that. I'm asking about the May and the Uh, my Lord, I, I, well, I, I can't, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the well, I mean, the, the lock up number is fine. Well, just for the record, my Lord, I don't think, I don't, I can't anticipate whether this affects the thinking of the court, but um, if you look at Mr. Landor's witness statement uh, at tab <coughs> 26, paragraph. Nine. He lists the positive forest of documents on the website, including those that my lord is canvassing, and says these are produced as Exhibit Six. Um, they were in the High Court as Exhibit Six, and in preparing for this court, the hard copy case file. Instruct the hard copy case file, um, and I have them in front of me because I've, I've kept the High Court bundle. So, everybody involved in this litigation, absent my only friend specifically, but all the parties knew of, uh, of that exhibit. And were they in fact signed? Um, there's oh, well. one that's undated um, and, and signed, there's one that's dated 27 July. 2011 and signed, and there's one that's undated, stamped draft, uh, again signed. I'm just, I'm just reading from the. And, my Lord, what, what, is your, what is your submission? My, my submission, my Lord, is, is twofold. The first is, had, as Mr. Landor said, looked at the someone looked at the website in that period, December to May, they would have been confronted with three versions of decision notices, all of which appear to have been signed. Including a version that had the conditions on it. At Best, my lord, I, I can't because I didn't visit the website myself. I can't take it much further. But at best, one would say the position was confused. But if you were seeking to establish the correct position, 
you would have known from the same website that the, the only authority that the council had was to issue the versions that were or contained the conditions, because that was the terms of the authority of the minutes of the meeting. But yes, you would have seen, presumably, if one had looked, the December 2011 version as well. But certainly, the position would have been, as I said, at best confused. We, my client, didn't look at the website. There's no evidence that anyone else looked at the website in that period, nor had any particular reason to, because they weren't aware and wouldn't have been aware that a document had been issued in December 2011, and there's no statutory or other procedure for notifying parties that documents have gone on the website in that way. But the very best Mr. Landor can really get from looking at the website is an uncertain position, certainly a precarious one, and certainly one, if he's saying he relied upon the December version, um, one in which he knew a mistake had been made. So in that five-month period where it's said time is technically running against my client, even though they have no knowledge that this, this is happening, had they gone to the website, um, in my submission, they would have best be confronted with a confused position as anyone else would have done. In May, although this appears to relate to a time when there were then six notices up on the website, page 9, when Mr. Landor visited in May, we know from the July 2017 report that the eventually the correct version of the, what should have been the correct version of the notice was put on the website. And any member of the public, my clients, public at large, from May onwards, from 2012, would have been clearly of the view that the correct permission had been issued and was operative. And that position prevailed until matters came to a head in 2017, at which point my client, once they became aware, once they became aware July, of... July, was that June 17? I think it was July 2017 was when we were sent the report that I've just taken your, your lordships to. That's the first we were told that there was a problem. And we then acted with an uh, expedition and bring the claim. No one, no one suggests otherwise. Now, um, so just but on your analysis, then, um, between December, well, between the signing of the Section 106 agreement, or the execution of that deed, and May 2012, uh, fault and holdings were without any planning permission, or, or they, were, they had a planning permission. They had a planning permission issued on, in December 2011, which they knew was unlawful. They knew. There's no other way of looking at it. It's not, it, and it, my lord, your lordship's obviously extremely familiar with this area of challenges to planning permissions, where the challenge doesn't actually really lie to the decision notice, but to the process, i.e. there's an error in the committee report which led to the grant of permission. That's where there's a latent defect in the process which someone may want to challenge but which a developer won't necessarily be aware of. They, they won't have thought of the same points as the prospective litigant. They may believe the planning permission is perfectly lawful. This developer knew. Mr. Lock, our mind has been very candid. He said that this accepts their, their readers and mistake readers. Yes, but my lord, that A takes us out of all of the previous cases that we've, we've looked at, or we haven't looked at, and B demonstrates when one talks about prejudice, to what extent can you 
unfairly say you're prejudiced in relying upon a document you know to be unlawful. Certainly in the Tap Ely case, the, the court was very clear. It, you can't rely upon a document you know to be unlawful at all. Uh, th that's what the court said, and in my submission, that, that's why this case is a very exceptional case, but they knew it. But I want to just take your lordships a little bit further, if I may. What did the appellant do? Well, they didn't raise it with the authority, even though they had this confused position. But they then, um, let's be clear, acted in a way entirely contrary to the notion that they were relying upon that planning permission at all. And back to the chronology, which my learned friend just simply doesn't deal with, didn't deal with at all. If you pick up the supplementary... Uh, bundle again. Um, the first document that occurs um, in the bundle after, after the issue is a document, uh, page 92, a letter from the council dated the 14th of June 2012. So contemporaneous with that period complaining about failure to comply with the covenants in the Section 106 agreement. Page, Page 92. There's no evidence of what answer was ever given. I'm not sure an answer was ever received. But your, apropos of the debate earlier in the day, on my Lord's analysis and Mr. Lockhart Mummery's analysis, the appellant was under the impression that they weren't bound by the Section 106 at all. You recall he said it's conditional upon the grant of the permission in the terms. His submission is they were not bound by the Section 106. A letter comes from the local planning authority saying you need to comply with the covenants. No response that I'm aware of, let alone a response to the effect, what are you talking about? We don't, we're not bound by the Section 106 at all because you've issued a permission <coughs> different to that which is in Schedule 2. Well, again, what, so what do you get from that? Well, well I, I, get from, I get from that that if you, I'm sitting back and creating the impression to the authority that the position is one which is bound by the Section 106 and the permission, you can hardly then complain that you've been prejudiced by a late challenge that subsequently occurs. Lord, the next document, page 94, just bears a little bit of scrutiny. I'm conscious of the time, but this is an application on a council form made on the 13th of March 2013. You get the date on page 96. This is, see the heading, application for approval of details reserved by condition. It's made by the appellant, by Mr. Paul Doughty of SDA, another architect or planning agent. So it's made by the appellant. Over the page, pre-application advice. There had been a site visit by the council with this agent to the site on the 12th of February 2013, at which site visit explained the information required. What were they submitting for approval? You will see section 5, proposed erection of three marquees. They gave the reference number of the planning permission at 11000445. They gave the date of the decision, 11th of November 2011. That is the document my learned friend is now describing as bogus. If that is right, the appellant was making a bogus application on a bogus document. This is an application to discharge the conditions on the November 2011 document. The other important point to note, I thought, the evidence is silent about this, the appellant clearly had the November 2011 document. It said Mr. Landor first saw it. The words are chosen very carefully. Mr. Landor saw it first time in 2017. The appellant clearly didn't. 
nor did its other agent, because they were making an application based upon it in 2013 to discharge all of the conditions. None of this was explained to the court. What happens? He pays a fee of £91 over the page, 96. And at the bottom of page 95, he's attached a master site plan and specification of the works for discharge of each one of those conditions, noise barriers, car parking, etc. We're even told when the development started. We've got that at page 95. Just above discharge of condition, has the development already started? If yes, please state when the development started. November 2011. My lords, how can it properly be said that this appellant is prejudiced by reliance upon a December 2011 document when their agent has gone in in writing confirming that they actually started the development in November 2011? So where is that passage? It's um, 95. Yeah. It's just below the second hole punch. Has it been already started? If yes, please state when the development started. November 2011. That predates the December document. And over the page, my lords, declaration. We hereby apply for Franklin Petitions describing this form, company drawings. We confirm to the best of my knowledge any facts stated are true and accurate and any opinions given are genuine opinions of the persons giving them. These are important documents. They're not, they're not just uh, applications you can make without being candid. So, my lords, what we know from the contemporaneous document not addressed before your lordship is that the appellant, through this particular agent, has the November 2011 document, is treating it as not bogus. To the contrary, they're discharging the conditions under it. They've already started the development in November 2011 before receipt of the December document. They're paying money to their consultant, both for the fee and also for the production of work to discharge it. And they've had a site visit. The, the planning office has come to the site to discuss what's required. My Lord, that is no longer being silent. And that is why the judge talked about unconscionable conduct. That is, in effect, endorsing the veracity of a document we know to be bogus. I, it's impossible to see it in any other way. And, my lords, it doesn't stop there. Page 17, uh, tab 17, the insulation of septic tanks. My learned friend relies, or still relies upon the insulation of septic tanks. We've, there's evidence that we gave, which isn't controverted, that these were actually installed, at least one of them was installed prior to any permission being granted. But these septic tank installations don't persist at all, one way or other, as to whether the appellant was under the impression they had a permanent permission. They're certainly contradicted by the documents I've just shown you, that they knew they had a temporary permission with conditions attached to it. But if, if you turn to page 99, sorry, that's the other septic tank one. If you turn to page 102, on the 25th of July 2013, the council issued another notice granting an application made by the appellant for an extension to the existing marquee. Again, issued this time to Mr. Daniel Turner. And you can see um, condition one. The extensions hereby approved shall be for a temporary period only, expiring on the 11th of November 2016. That's the five-year period, of course, for the marquees. Reason, to minimise the impact on the Greenbelt and to accord with the temporary consent for the marquee. So... What the appellant and its agent receive back from the authority is a temporary consent reflecting what the council is unequivocally identifying is a temporary consent for the original marquee. Rightly or wrongly, 
that is the counsel's understanding. Does the appellant know that's the understanding? Of course. Does the appellant challenge this decision? No. They say we're prejudiced, we might have issued an appeal had we known that it was not permanent. My Lord, there's no appeal against this. And indeed, if you had received this and believed you had a permanent permission, you would have immediately say, what on earth is going on? We have a permanent permission. Why have you imposed a condition on our extension which is unlawful? Again, none of this dealt with. So when it comes, uh, that covers this in the period 2012, 2013. When it comes to the crunch, when would either the council or in any other party actually other get to know that there's a dispute about the five-year condition? Of course, when the five-year period comes to an end, which it did at the end of 2016. And in my submission, if you know that there's a unlawful permission that's been issued to you, people are assuming that there's a five-year limit, as the council has indicated. You know that come November 2016, the issue is going to come to a head. And you are proceeding at risk in that knowledge, either sitting silent or, in fact, in my submission, positively creating or endorsing the impression that the November 2011 Commission was the one that was the relevant one. And I, I ask, if, in the spirit of rhetorically, how much more exceptional can one get than that? I defy my learned friend to find any case where the appellant has actually not just sat silent, but actually can, I call it endorse, but however one wants to put it, and made an application on what they what believed apparently was a bogus document. It certainly, so far as the public are concerned and the public interest, is completely contrary to the public interest, and it's antithetical to expect the claims of the interested party to know that there's a problem. I've taken your Lordships to page 110, which was the crunch time coming. The Council, understandably, at this stage, believing there's a temporary consent, write to the company after the temporary consent period has expired, notifying the unauthorised marquees. And that's when the issue comes to a head. There's a meeting we, we're not party to. And eventually, um, it emerges for the first time that the appellant's now relying upon the December document. They've never relied upon it before in front of any party. To the contrary, they relied on the November 2011, what they call bogus document. This is the first time they show their hand. And at that point, of course, prompt um, expeditious challenges brought by my clients after the local authority don't issue proceedings themselves. Well, I'm just slightly concerned about the time. Um, we've had two hours now. We've got, we've, we've got to allow Mr. Uh, Evans an opportunity to say something. Um, how much longer are we going to be now? He said it might be half an hour. That would take us in court. If we stopped in five or ten minutes, that would take us to 2024. Um, and I, 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 I suspect I, I might not be that long because I think just about everything I would have said has probably been canvassed. I'm, I will add, I think, probably a few short points. I'm, not, I will, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious I'm on borrowed time in that case, and uh, I'm, I will try and be as short as I can. I've, I've come to the end of the facts, because at this point, there's no dispute that we've acted expeditiously. The, the period in question, in reality, relates to that period in December 2011 through to May 2012, when we're supposed to have monitored throughout and brought uh, a challenge. I've explained why we don't consider that that's right. I've explained why it's exceptional. And in any event, um, to meet your Lordship's point, the court has the power to extend time beyond that five-month period if there's good reason. And in my sense... Sorry. Well, yeah. 
So, um, my Lord, um, you asked me what's exceptional about this case. And can I just give you... Uh, there's quite a long list, but can I just tell you what they are? First of all, the permission was issued unlawfully with no authority by the officer. Secondly, that was known by the appellant and if the appellant likes, also by the council. So that's a point in my favour. Thirdly, with that knowledge, the appellant on its case did nothing to confront the issue. Fourthly, in May 2012, the council suppressed any ability for the public to know there was a problem, in, as my learned friend puts it, by putting up the 2011 notice. Sorry. November 2012. They put up the November 2000 and then took down the December one. So, sorry, the council suppressed it. <coughs> I mean, that, that you lay squarely at the door of the council. Well, my lord, I, 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 I'm not. I'm laying it squarely at the door of either the council or the appellant. The, well, how can you lay it at the door of the appellant? There may be many other things. No, I can't, no, not for suppress. I can't, no, no not for suppressing. No, you've been piling them up. No, you're, no you're, your lordship's right, sorry, I re retract that. What, what I meant to say was the position's a bit more nuanced in the sense that there were th at least three documents on the website, and my learned friend characterizes it as a suppression. On well, one analysis, you could say that perhaps you ought to be given a chance to confront it before Mr. Evans has his suggestions. Um, Council evidently knew that something had gone wrong in May 2012, or by May 2012, because it acted at that point to take down the three documents that were on the website, including the planning commission that had issued the planning commission, and to put out a document which was effectively predated. Yes. Um, the council, for its part, as I, as I understand, I'm not aware of them, alert. So they didn't alert your Certainly didn't alert my client. I don't, as as I, I I don't believe they've they alerted no. Mr. Lockhart Munn, Mr. President. No. So you say the council suppressed the ability, your client's ability, to act. Yes, my lord, because in a conventional case, <coughs> if you're talking about a five year delay, you're talking about something that's on the public register which is available for someone to challenge or a decision that's out there to a challenge. They know about it for that whole period. Yeah. Here, once that document has gone, we didn't know it was there in the first place, but once it's gone, that it's not, it wouldn't even <coughs> be open to anyone to notice um, that there was a problem after May 2012 because the yeah. document had been removed. Five, five years goes by, and as we see, when it comes to the July 2017 report, they can't explain to the members what's happened. No, that's right. Because people have moved on. So it was all covered in that uh, op opacity at that stage. Save for what then happens between the council and yeah. the appellant, sure. which is important between 2012 and 2013. Yeah. Because um, whilst it was suppressed from us, the facts weren't suppressed at that subsequent, from those subsequent events from the appellant because they then acted on the November 2011 document. They must have received it. Mr. Landor says he didn't, but the appellant did and his other agent did. They were the only ones who, knew, who would know there was a problem, not us, nor the public. The appellant knew that there was a problem in the council. Well, your, your fourth exception Sorry. Yeah, the, is that the council suppressed the ability to act. Yes. That means your client or anyone else. Fifth, the planning commission wasn't issued to anyone else 
and there's no evidence that anyone else knew about it, save for the, the public. Seven, the appellant... So, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, six, the appellant wasn't just silent. They acted on the basis of the November 2011 document. At least twice. And I think I'm on seven. The temporary nature of the permission that should have been issued means that the opportunity to discover something had gone wrong only arose at the end of the five-year period. What I call the crunch time in contrast to cases where you see development going up, where you can say, well, hold on a minute, where's the permission for that? Um, I don't know, am I on eight? Yes. <laughs> as soon as it became apparent that that was the case, the claimant acted extremely promptly. That's not a reason why it's exceptional. Well, my lord, it's part and of the thing. That these are the reasons why it's exceptional. Yes. Well, my lord, it's part of the package. But I, I, if your lordship wants to exclude it on the basis, it's not a point against us, I suppose. But, it, but we did actually, you, your lordship, see it act extremely quickly. Um, nine, um, my lord, that there isn't actually any. Um, reasonable evidence of prejudice caused to the appellant for all the reasons that I've just been through. They, they knew and acted on the November 2011 permission. Um, and uh, by contrast, in terms of exceptional circumstances, there is very plain <coughs> prejudice, not just to my client who isn't allowed marquees in the green belt and other people, but to the planning system. Because if these if this permission is not quashed, a permanent consent for these marquees. with none of the conditions that should have been <laughs> attached and with no requirement to use the money for restoration will have been granted in perpetuity contrary to the green belt grade two star <coughs> listed building grade two star registered park and garden the, the, the prejudice to the our public benefit of allowing that to occur is huge. And um, well, that really summarises what's exceptional. Um, I just need to emphasise, can I just give you some references for the, in the, the authorities? Um, you know, um, I'll do this as quickly as I can. First of all, um, in relation to the point about um, acting without authority, you have in the bundle Taff Ely case, and I just draw your lordship's attention to what's said at page 11 of the report. Right, this is acting without authority, tab number? Um, it's tab 14, Cooperative Retail Services and Taff Ely, and it's the passage of Lord Denning, what must be taken at its face value. Page? Page 11, top hand um, of the document, it's actually 238 of the law report itself. But if you look at page 11 at the top, um, there's some pagination at the top. Must it be taken at face value? And the answer is uh, no. Um, applying the Norfolk case, as you'll see in the 
central passage. People may act on it, and it will have that effect of the acting on it, but can someone who knows it's ultra rise rely upon it? Answer no. Applying that to this case of grant of planning permission is ultra rise and void, so Tesco cannot rely on it. They cannot build a superstore in the faith of it. In contrast, the conveyance to someone else may have been good. Norfolk County Council, tab 15, but cited in that case, um, Lord Widgery, um, page 675, letter. Which tab? Um, sorry, it's the next tab, my Lord. Tab 15. Tab 15. Uh, it, it, it's 675A to B and then 676E to F. Six seven six E to F, and your your lordship's main note um, at six seven seven they deal with the question of mistake and being happy that the in the conclusion of the appeal should succeed because it produces for everybody the exact same position as if the mistake had not been made. Which, which, uh, That's uh, at uh, 677H. This is a power of court to remedy what everyone knows is a mistake. And then, my lord's. Um, sorry, I'm not finding your passage now. I'm so sorry, my lord. That was that was um, this oh, passage. Sorry, I've got it now. Yeah. E to E G. It, it, on six seven seven. It's yes. Right. And F. What one hopes to achieve in a situation like this, where there's been an honest mistake, is that everybody shall end up in the position which they would have been if no mistake had been made. Well, I couldn't speak, put it better than for this case than quashing this permission. Um, and my lord, then if. I said I just chart those three cases where there have been um, consideration of extensions of time. Finn Kelsey's at tab seven. I gave you the reference to paragraph twenty-five as to what satisfies promptness, and at paragraph twenty-nine. Having found that the claim is not brought promptly, the court then said it was necessary to go and look on the substance of the claim, i.e. the underlying invalidity, before deciding whether or not to knock it out. Your Lordships can see that, paragraph 29. So even in cases where the decision has not been brought prompt, the court doesn't stop there. It looks at the substance of the underlying illegality because that can affect the question of whether or not to extend time. And then um, Gerber, um, which your lordships will find in the same bundle um, of authorities at tab two. Can I invite your lordships to read um, at some point paragraphs 18? through to 35, because Lord Justice Sales sets out the facts in much more detail than the head note. And your Lordships will see from that <coughs> that the context of Mr. Gerber not saying he knew about the application was in circumstances where there had been two public consultations in the village of the proposal, advertisements in the parish hall notice board, and then notices sent out in accordance with the procedural order. So whilst they accepted that he didn't have notice, it was fair to assume that he, um, the, the council had done everything it could to bring it to the attention of the parties through those processes. And thereafter, your lordships will see the immediate divergence from the facts here. The company spent a huge amount of money on the strength of the permission after it had been granted and indeed um, constructed the solar farm, paragraph uh, 20, um, 
three, they, a new company entered into a 25-year lease. The, company, the solo farm was built. And in the meantime, Mr. Gerber took legal advice, which suggested he didn't have a claim, even though he then knew about the notice. So there were two periods of delay. In interfering with the court's decision below, Lord Justice Sales exercised the Court of Appeals' discretion um, having regard to the error that had been made about legitimate expectation. In my submission, there's no such error on the part of the judge here. There was, there's no in, way in, uh, of the striking of the balance. But in paragraph 48 and 49, the underlying principle of Gerber is explained by Lord Justice Sales, where a fair opportunity has been given to objectors to learn in good time about the proposed development uh, in compliance with notification rules, then in view of the possible harm, it's reasonable to expect them to and move with speed. Just, I'm so sorry, sorry. Uh, 48, D to E. And then 49. And um, my lords, when you analyse the facts of Gerber, they are a, a classic example of not allowing extension to the conventional situation but emphasising um, that none of the exceptional circumstances, certainly none of the factors I've identified, were present. And then in Connors, my Lord Justice um, Lindblom's judgment, um, I, I gave you the paragraph numbers, but it's, I think, 74 to 87 of that judgment, which, again, analyses the facts. Tab is that? That's, um, Connors is a tab one. Seventy-four through to um, eighty-seven explains why there was no basis for interfering with the judge below's discretion not to extend time. Again, very different circumstances. The applicants knew that their decision had been called in, and they had the ability to challenge as soon as that had occurred. Instead, they chose to wait a long time, and indeed await the outcome of their underlying planning appeal. But paragraph 87 um, is the passage I cited at the outset. It all depends on the facts. It's rarely appropriate, I accept. I accept rarely appropriate. I don't demur from that, but it all depends on the facts. Um, Lords, can I refer you to my skeleton argument where I pick up on the alleged errors that are uh, said to have occurred in the judge's submissions? And I just um, want, I, I've dealt with condition one. Uh, which is said to, to have been misunderstanding by the judge, <coughs> dealt with his view of the planning merits. Uh, so I don't repeat any of those submissions, but, my Lord, I do invite you to read his judgment um, again to see whether there is any actual error in the way he approached it. My submission, no. And, indeed, he directed himself earlier in the judgment to those passages relied upon in Gerber where he, he was directed to the correct tests, and he went on to apply them. Is there anything surprising in the outcome he reached? Uh, I, I submit not at all, when you take into account the facts he had for him. Um, my Lord, I, I've trespassed on my own friend's time and your time, but... Uh, Thank you very uh, much. Yes, Mr. Thank you, my lords. I just want to deal briefly with um, three or four short topics. Generally, I adopt the submissions of my learned friend, uh, Mr. Scrawl. Um, the first matter I just wanted to say a few words about was the alleged misunderstanding by the judge of the intended scope of Condition 1 in relation to the permission as it should have been issued, as, as we put it. Um, I, I think the court has reached the point that the correct analysis of the situation is that whilst there wasn't um, any obligation in the condition for the marquees to be removed at the end of a five-year period, it was nevertheless a permission which was limited in time. And to that extent, when that time period was up, the marquees would then be 
um, at that point unlawful. And I, I wholly subscribe to, to that analysis. What, what I just wanted to do very briefly was just set that within the statutory scheme and then relate that to what the judge said and those paragraphs that Mr. Lockhart Mummery relies on in order to say that um, the judge misunderstood the scope of the condition. And I should say, I don't think there were any submissions made to the judge, certainly not in detail, on this particular point um, at, at the hearing below. Um, could, could I just go very briefly, my lord, to tab, um, tab, tab 21 of the authorities bundle? That, that's section 72 of the Town and Country Planning Act, which deals with conditional grants of planning permission. And subparagraph B of subsection 1 uh, enables an authority to impose a condition for requiring the removal of any buildings or works authorised by a permission or a discontinuance of a use of land at, a specified, uh, at the end of a specified period. And, and such, um, such a condition brings in train with it the definition at subparagraph 2, which is a permission granted for a limited period. And one of the particular consequences of a permission granted for a limited period is found in section 57, which is tab 17, which prescribes in subsection 2 that where you have such a permission granted for a limited period, Planning permission is not normally required for the resumption at the end of that period of its use for the purpose for which it was normally used before the permission was granted. So th those are the statutory powers. Uh, but none of that undercuts the point that if a permission is time limited and then that time limit goes past, then the development is unlawful at that point. And my submission when that is tied into what the judge said is that the judge didn't betray any misunderstanding of what the scope of that condition was. I understand the learned friend to have relied particularly on paragraph 48 of the judgment. where the judge says, in this case, the presence of the marquees was not contrary to the intended scope of the planning commission and contrary to the LPA's decision until December 2016. Their presence only became malign, if at all, in late 2016, not in 2011. In my submission, that doesn't betray any misunderstanding whatsoever of the scope of the condition. And so far as paragraph 71 is concerned, where the judge indicated that um, the marquees should not be there unless permitted to remain under a fresh and lawfully granted planning permission and, a, uh, and in accordance with the terms of that planning permission, then that in my submission is effectively a statement of the law because Mr. Lockhart Mummery relied in particular on an application under Section 73 of the Town and Country Planning Act, and he said that an, an application could have been made to continue with the marquees without complying with that permission. Well, that would be a fresh planning permission. The Lord Lord Justice Lindbom will ap well appreciate that. Alternatively, there, there could have been... Um, a, a standalone, as it were, fresh planning application, not under Section 73. So my submission is that um, there is nothing to substantiate the complaint that Mr. Lockhart Mummery makes about the judge misunderstanding the scope of the permission and the condition that should have formed Condition 1 of the, of the planning permission. 
Um, next, I think it's incumbent on me to say something about the Council's knowledge of the error. And I think I have to be frank in relation to that. And in relation to that, if one treats the Council as a corporate entity, then I suppose it could be said that it was known at the outset that there was an error. Now, it may well be that one person in the council um, didn't really appreciate that, but another person did. If the knowledge had been combined, then yes, as a corporate entity, the council may be said to have been aware of it. The knowledge was located in the council as a body, I suppose it could be said. Realistically, I think the position comes down to what happened a, a little bit later on in May 2012. And I, I have to accept, and the Council, I think, has always accepted during the course of these proceedings, that what it did then was ineffective. Um, and I think I, I also have to accept that in practical terms, its effect was as described by each of my learned friends because once the December decision notice was no longer on the website and there was simply the backdated November 2011 decision notice, then anyone who looked at the website from that period on would not have had any inkling that there was some issue. A person who had looked at it before then and looked at it after then might have seen the difference in the website, but a person who looked before, uh, a person who didn't look before and only looked at some point after, November, uh, after May 2012 would simply have seen uh, what was on the website. And um, whilst suppress is a word that carries um, connotations that perhaps uh, are uh, rather derogatory. Um, I, I, I don't see why I should um, s seek to substitute a different word. The, the effect, I have to accept, of what was done was to prevent, perhaps that's a more neutral word, from that point onwards, uh, anyone detecting that there was an error. What I would resist, because the, um, the evidence doesn't take us there, is that there was an intention to suppress. Um, we, we know is it, is what... It really, is it really, I, mean, I don't know if this thing goes very far to be honest, but is it actually really credible that when the decision had to be made in May 2012, as to what notice to put up, nobody actually looked to see what the plan of permission was that had been granted? Is, is that really credible? Well, I, I, I accept the council should have. The council should have. The, the council itself should have. Should have. The point was to decide which of these should be should be remain. So the question is, and we go to find out what the planning permission is. Yes. Yes, I mean that that that, that there should have been further investigation at that point. I, 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 don't, I don't think I can really. I'm not I, sure you assist us very much here at the time. Fair enough. Um, but I mean that's. Uh, that, 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 that's a failure. I have to accept that. But I, I'm not accepting that there was an intention to suppress. Um, that's, the, that, 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 that's the point I'm making there. Well, just one further point on this. Do, do you accept it was also a failure not to alert both the applicant and the objector? Yes, I think I, I think I have to accept. I think I have to accept that a planning authority realising that something was amiss at that stage should have done should have, should have done something more than it did do. I don't think I can realistically gainsay gainsay that. Mr. Evans, do you differ from Mr. Strawn's submission as to the original letter being beyond the powers of an officer given the nature of the resolution? A absolutely. Yes, you accept it, what he said? Oh yes, that? yes. It, it was it, it was it was it, it was entirely unauthorised. I, as I say, I I I I, 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 I adopt Mr. Mr. Strawn's submission. I, I would submit that, 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 that there's no question about that. and um, I didn't actually understand that to be a ground of appeal before this court. 
in terms of the substantive position, it rather turned into a ground of appeal in the learned friend's submission. But the way the matter is put is that it's a matter that's relevant to discretion. That's the way it's put in the skeleton argument, rather than seeking to say that there was a that there wasn't a substantive error. But um, the, the council has always been absolutely clear um, that this was a planning permission issued without authorization. Well, uh, and what about the, the putting out of the emergency condemnment officers? That was both unlawful because it was altering the planning register in, a, in an inaccurate way. Yeah. It, it, yes, it did alter the planning register. In an inaccurate way. In an inaccurate way. And was that authorised or not? No, that, that wasn't authorised. Right, so it's both unlawful and unlawful. Yes, I think I have. I, th I think I have to. I think I have to accept. It. As I say, my, my 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 submission was mainly designed to um, hope that your lordships would accept that it wasn't with us. It wasn't with an intention to suppress. It was. It was unlawful. It was misguided. Um, so, um, the, the, the next point. The next point that I wanted to um, address, in a sense, follows on from that, um, and that that is that the chronology doesn't stop at that point, um, because of course, um, as Mr. Strong has submitted. Um, once those actions had taken place, then the actions of the developer thereafter gave the impression to the council that the developer too was acting on the basis that the November document was in fact um, the, the correct planning permission. Um, and whilst that, whilst that doesn't excuse what the council did, then, of course, it's relevant to the learned friend, uh, Mr. Strong, Mr. Strong's case. Um, could I just next say a very brief word in, in relation to the topic of revocation that was discussed this morning? I think at one point the court was proceeding on the basis that the planning permission could have been revoked at any point before it was clocked. Um, I, I don't, with respect, think that's quite correct. There's, we've, we've got section 97 of the Town and Country Planning Act in the, uh, in the authority book. Just give me a moment to turn it up. It's 25. Sub, um, subsection 97 1 um, conveys the power. Subsection 3 indicates that the power may be exercised in the case of planning commission that relates to the carrying out of buildings or other operations at any time before those operations have been completed. Um, so once the operations in terms of the permanent erection of the marquee were completed, then that power would no longer have been available. I think it's probably a point of detail because there may have been a power under section 102 to require the removal of buildings, also bringing in trade with it a compensation liability. So if it's not 97, it's 102. If it's not 97, I think it would probably be 102. I think that's a point, a, a point of detail. I, I thought it was worth referring to that. So, so it could have been revoked? It could, have been, it could have been revoked at any time before the, it could have been revoked at any time before the marquee were permanent, permanently completed. Or otherwise section 102. Or otherwise section 102 would have been the requisite. 
And the only other topic... It's sorry, Mr. Evans, again, to, to break in. <coughs> I take it that there never was a decision not to revoke. No, there wasn't. No. There's no evidence that there was, but is it implicit in anything that happened that somebody thought about revocation and decided no, we'll simply write the other letter? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not even... I, that, the, the, the evidence doesn't go there. I think, I think the position is largely, as, as my Lord, Lord Justice Lindblom said, that the facts are largely lost in the mists of time, and the so-called mayor culpa report goes as far as it can. So I can't say that a decision was taken. We're not going to revert, but we'll put another, we'll put another document on the website. It's, in, it's impossible to, to infer that. Uh, the, the, only other, the only other point I wanted to, to deal with was just to draw your Lordship's attention to one or two passages from the case law, if I may, in relation to some of the... I think, uh, I'm just going back to the Flockhart Mum report. There is your time now to reply. How long are you going to be? Um, I'm going to be not more than five minutes. Uh, Gerber tab two... Paragraph 49 is one of the paragraphs that your Lordships have been referred to. The only point I wanted to make in relation to paragraph 49 is that one of the rationales for the strict time limit set forth by Lord Justice Sale is that extending um, time so that a legal objection could be mounted by someone who happened to remain unaware of what was going on until many months later, would unfairly prejudice the interests of a developer who wishes to rely upon a planning permission, which appears to have been lawfully granted. And I simply wanted to highlight that the appearance to the person who seeks to rely on the planning permission of what it was that he had in his hand is um, a relevant matter that underpins the rationale for the time limit. And I adopt in their entirety my learned friend Mr. Strawn's submission in relation to the developer's knowledge of the fact that what was in his hands was in error and all the consequent submissions following on from that Next, I just wanted to make a very brief point in relation to the issue of prejudice and how prejudice should be um, should be attacked, should 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 be approached in circumstances where a developer understands that his permission may be at risk. This is Holder, tab four, in the Court of Appeal. And I simply give your Lordship the reference to paragraphs 30 and 31, and in particular paragraph 31, where the court took a cherry attitude to a developer's claims of reliance when the developer must have appreciated the risks. And I, I say that's pertinent in this case. And finally, I just wanted to deal with a very short point, which I think relates more to Mr. Strawn's case than anything I might say, uh, but I draw it to the court's attention. And it concerns the issue that the court was concerned about at one stage in the hearing, and that was who was present at the original committee meeting in September 2011. Um, and what um, the uh, what the what the interested party, the first respondent, did thereafter, in terms of monitoring the planning commission. Um, a similar issue arose in the case of Gavin. This is tab eight, and the matter was dealt with by 
Mr Justice Richards, I think it was, as, as, as he then was. And could I give your lordships the paragraph references um, 68 and 69? 68 and 69. And this was in the context of a submission that a, a, a person should have, with, with professional advice uh, and a substantial business, should have checked that um, certain things that were expected to be done by the planning authority had been done. And paragraph 69 in particular um, deals with the issue that my learned friend, Mr. Scorn, was dealing with as a matter of principle about not being under an obligation to monitor the lawfulness of what a planning authority was doing. And um, Mr. Justice Richards um, rejected any argument that there should be um, such a, a duty whereby um, a person was required to, to, to monitor uh, what a planning authority was, was doing. And the gist, of it, the gist of it was that local authorities should be um, they, they should be the persons who discharge their responsibilities rather than have their actions checked by a, I've attempted to do that. You've been very, you've been very efficient, thank you very much. As economical as You have, you have been very good. Thank you. Just got my mum in, sorry, you've been squeezed. Um, I've got about six or seven points. Um, I will deal with them as shortly as I can. Thank you. Um, Lord, uh, I take this point first because it was canvassed lightly first by Mr. Strawn and then dealt with at greater length, but I'll deal with it now. Um, <coughs> and, and that is that um, I didn't draw the court's attention to the application for approval of details um, that was made in March 2013. That the, the, the actual reason was that I skipped an entire page in my notes in, in seeking to meet the time limit. Um, but that's not a proper reason. Um, I need to go to uh, that uh, matter, my lord, and can I first deal with um, the uh, deal with this point by reference to the judgment? Um, paragraph 18. On 13 March 2013, a different agent of the interested party, Mr. Doughty, applied to discharge the conditions relating to various matters, basing himself on the position as he understood it to be, as at 11 November 2011, the date of the Section 106 agreement and the date attributed to the notice, then on the LPA's website. So, my lord, that, that is, um, with respect, correct. Um, SDA are architects, they weren't the planning agent, they were simply instructed to discharge conditions and they looked at the website. And as um, my own friend Mr. Strawn said at one stage, um, and I quote him, anyone would be clear that that, that's to say November 11, that that was the operative planning commission go to the website, that's what you'd see. That's what Mr. Doughty of SDA uh, did. And likewise, the same point goes to the uh, point on tab 18, which was a planning permission for an extension to the Marquis, which again was Mr. Uh, Doughty of SDA acting um, on the same assumption. So it is not correct, and my learned friend made great flack of this, it is not correct um, to submit that um, uh, we were blowing hot and cold, effectively, um, and that um, we were ourselves relying on a bogus document. Uh, in the real world, this is what happens. A new agent is instructed to carry out some technical function. Uh, he doesn't uh, consult the planning history, doesn't talk to Mr Landor, he checks the website, he sees it's a planning commission, dated November 11, and he acts accordingly. 
So we'll hold that is at that first point. Second, my lord, there was much um, uh, submission about the earlier planning history. Um, that is to say 2006, 2007, uh, and so forth. Now, my lord, a number of applications were made by my clients in relation to uh, those developments, but I'm not going to go there. The court will not profit um, by dealing with matters that are quite extraneous to the issue. What is, I accept, not extraneous to the issue is that the lakeside marquee was, as I said at the outset, erected prior to the grant of the planning commission. Only the lakeside. But I accept that point to that extent. My Lord, next, um, the intended condition one um, My Lord Lord Justice Limblom said at a later stage of argument, condition one doesn't positively require removal, but after five years um, it, it would be liable to enforcement action, as if, I, as if that was a shift in the position from what I had submitted. It wasn't, my Lord, it, it, it wasn't such with respect. I mean, I, I think that that's what I submitted at, at the outset. Um, Um, uh, so what are you saying about this? So on, on, on the, as in getting condition one, you're accepting. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't. It didn't. It never one. contains a requirement to to, to remove. Yes. I accept that had the permission been granted in that form, and had five years passed, and had the marquees or any of them remained, uh, they would then have become <coughs> liable to enforcement action as being either development without planning permission or I think not development in breach of the condition because there was no condition requiring removal. But I accept it would have been open to enforcement action and then if that enforcement action had uh, been confirmed, um, the uh, uh, penalties would, would follow. My Lord, next, and an important point, in my submission, and it's a matter for the court now to judge in the round, in my submission, uh, the first respondent has failed to explain why it didn't check the register. It was professionally advised it's a uh, significant commercial company. It made objections throughout the process, as has been referred to. Indeed, Mr. Gilbert was instructed to make a request for call-in after the resolution. And I would add, my lord, that, um, as has been rightly said, 14 months elapsed from the um, resolution to the uh, through to the um, execution of the 106 and the grant of the planning commission, in fact, about a month later. All the more reason for anyone to check the register to check what decision was issued. And really, there's been, apart from saying, um, well, it's all a bit difficult. Um, is one supposed to search the website until the planning commission emerges? It is the work of two minutes, carried out, say, every month, to check a website, check the planning register. And what, it about, what about uh, Mr. Evans' point about the statement of Lord Justice, uh, of Mr. Justice Stephen Richards, saying that people are entitled to assume that the council can have its function properly? 
Well, no, that that was in a case. Uh, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong because I, it, it's uh, two two days or so since I read Holder. Holder was a case where. I think it's uh, Gavin. It's Gavin. 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 I think was a case. So that was the case. It's tab nine. Um, tab eight. Uh, tab nine is literally. No, tab, eight. tab eight is a, tab eight. It's parallel sixty eight and sixty nine. Yeah. Um, well, that is, um, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, because as I said a moment since I looked at this, that was alleged errors arising in the course of a planning application process. And it was said by his lordship that um, effectively um, a third party can rely on the planning authority to deal with a matter uh, according to statutory requirements uh, and policy and so forth. Um, our case, of course, is concerned, it's concerned with the issue of uh, the grant of a planning permission after the application process has, has come to an end. Lord, I, th I think I think that this case was uh, a criticism about conduct, as I say, in the course of a planning application, whether regard was being had to the right matters, and and so forth, and whether. Um, so you say it doesn't go go to the principle that interested parties should check the website after, it, after the event. It doesn't go to, in, in my submission, that what was grappled with by Lord Justice Sales in Gerber. That's to say that people who are concerned about what's happening in their area should monitor um, the council's register to see whether a planning permission has been granted. That was the, that was the, uh, the failing by Mr. Gerber in that case. There's another point that I perhaps I should ask about this. Mr. Gilbert's um, evidence was that um, he was instructed about calling in. Well, I didn't hear the question, so sorry. I think Mr. Gilbert made some evidence about trying to get the matter called in. I don't think there's a date that's given. He does. He, he, um, I think the passage my Lord has in mind is tab 28, yes. Mr. Gilbert's second witness statement, page 185. That's right. Paragraph, uh, paragraph 5. Yes. Once the resolution had been passed and our subsequent representation of the government office to have Unsuccessful. There was no reason for me to be further involved. I had no client instructions to be involved. Further, whether I agreed with the resolution or not, it was going through a process that I could not influence or even monitor. And that, well, that's nonsense. With respect, of course he could monitor it. Well, he, he may be saying that once once he'd unsuccessfully sought call in, he could then, without instructions, so in the aftermath. When, when was the rejection of call in? I don't know. And one would have expected that to be within a month or so after September the 10th. Well, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if your Lordship will be aware that there's a limited time for yeah. the Secretary of State then to decide whether it's 28 days. It's 28 days, so it would be shortly after the 20, I don't have that site. But it would have been shortly after. He 
he doesn't, it is, I think my lord's right, because um, it must be that he simply didn't have, he had no instructions involved, because he goes in over the page to say, I have no client instructions to monitor the client council's website or to check it over the year after resolution is made. They establish whether the client has been granted in accordance with the resolution. Such a service is not often or paid for by the claimant. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's a decision that um, the first respondent made. Can I just assist you with the date? The call, the call in decision from the council's website is 23rd of September 2010. I.e., that's when the Secretary of State. No, that's not when it's 23rd. Uh, 23rd of sorry, which month? Apologies, my lord. Oh. So sorry. All right. right. So, what was the date of this note? You said something about the 23rd of September. Yes, but I'm, I'm, I'm so told, just, I'm told just, that's the wrong date. Twenty third of September two thousand and ten was the date that the Secretary of State decided not to call in the application. So the Mr. Gilbert's Gilbert's yeah, instruction related to the date period before that. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. So I think that was your point four. Um, and my Lord, I've truncated the points because I've dealt with some of them uh, together. Um, let me just check if I may. Um, yes, the, the, the only other point I, I, I'd seek to add is that um, Learning from Mr. Strawn has uh, uh, trodden uh, lightly, I think it's fair to say, over the um, prejudice aspects. Um, but I would just, as I did in opening, remind the court of tab 30. You gave us some passages there. I gave you passages of paragraph 3 and 4, which I again, urge the court to read um, in, in the round of the evidence. Yes. And I, uh, I tie that in, my Lord, with the speaking note that I handed in yes, a, it, and the way in which prejudice was and wasn't dealt with by the learning judge at all. Um, my Lord, I think, would you give me literally of course, 30 seconds to check? Well, whilst my learning is doing that, can I just raise one factual point? Which I wasn't present at the hearing below, but I think the court should be aware there were no submissions made seeking to resist the extension of time on the basis of revocation or discontinuance to the learning judge as I'm instructed. And I don't see them in the, either in the judgment or the skeleton arguments. I think the Lordship asked a question about the judge not dealing with them in his judgment, not dealing with that principle. But it wasn't an issue raised before. But if I'm if I'm wrong about that, I'll be correct. But I think that's a factual position. But I think am I wrong in thinking that, that revocation was raised in the skeleton argument here? Mr. Lockhart, you raised the question of revocation in the skeleton. I did indeed. You did. I did. You did. Well, I'm replying very briefly to my, instantly to my Lord's question. I'd better be absolutely clear about that. Um, um, I think I jumped too quickly, my lord. I don't, I don't see it there. Um, in 
music thing. Um, Some, somebody decided to put section 97 in the authority. Uh, no, that. Yes. Uh, that was that was that was I. Um, Lord, I think I, I, I think I answered too quickly. I apologise. I'm surprised that we're still in the hall. Uh, I seem to remember. I, I looked to Mr. Evans. I seem to remember that Section 97 was debated at the hearing because I think, indeed, I'm pretty certain. Mr. Evans made precisely the same point that he has on section 973A in Manchester a year ago. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you did. Well, Mr. Lockhart, I've always got a better memory than that. I really can't, I can't remember. <laughs> I'm not saying I didn't, I simply can't remember. Yes, I remember that. It was. <laughs> yes, it was canvassed kind of before the judge because my instructing solicitor remembers um, encouraging me to do so. <laughs> so anything else? Oh, no. Thank you. No. We're extremely grateful to all counsel in this case for their uh, very, very um, helpful uh, and, uh, and aided arguments. We will consider our judgment in this matter. Um, when we uh, distribute the judgment Please agree a form of order. If you don't wish to have any further submissions in or orally, this must say so. Thank you all.